Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jessica Holmes. I am one of the Green Mountain Care Board members here. Uh, our chair, Kevin Mullen, will be here soon, but I'm going to kick us off today. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. So Susan. Thank you. Thank you, board member Holmes. Welcome, everybody. I First, I'm going to start with some updates to our calendar and some reminders. First, on Monday, June 13th, which is this coming Monday, the board's general advisory committee will be meeting at 2 p.m. Via, via Teams. The focus of the meeting on Monday will be an update on the board's uh, report on hospital sustainability that was released to the legislature earlier this year and the recommendations from that report. We'll also be discussing S-285, which is now Act 167, and that law was created as a result of the re recommendations from the Green Mountain Care Board's sustainability report. Uh, we're going to be asking the advisory uh, committee for their input as we uh, endeavor uh, and, and work on the important uh, work in Act 167. And we're really looking forward to working with stakeholders in Vermont and the folks at the Agency of Human Services on that work and collaborating with them on it. In addition, as a reminder, we have um, a primary care advisory group meeting next month. This was just added to the calendar uh, next week, excuse me. That's at Ju on June 15th at 5.30. And then recently added to the, to the monthly um, calendar is on June 22nd, the Department of Mental Health will be uh, presenting to the Green Mountain Care Board on their priorities and, and some of the great work they're doing with our hospitals to address some of the wait times um, and issues in the emergency rooms and other parts of the healthcare system around mental health and how to address that. Um, I also want to just briefly remind folks, and I'd ask you to look at our website because we have several ongoing public comment periods. We'll be adding to them after today's presentation. We'll open, we've, we're opening one up today on a vitals budget. So uh, that uh, public comment period will go until June 17th, close of business, and that will give the board time to consider these comments ahead of the staff presentation and potential vote on June 22nd. Also, we have an ongoing public comment period for the Accountable Care Organization budget guidance. Um, and the Medicare only ACO guidance will be covered today. Um, and the certified ACO guidance and certification will be, be reviewed next week. Um, materials on this can be found on our website. And so also we ask that comments be submitted by Monday, June 20th, 20th in order to be considered by the board for their potential vote on June 22nd. And then uh, please look at the rate review uh, area of our website. As a reminder, we received the qualified health plan rate requests on May 6th. Uh, we opened up a public comment period for those rates and we'll be accepting public comments um, uh, until July 21st, uh, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. And uh, please look at, again, that website for the hearing dates later, later next month. And then the last but certainly not least public comment, which has been ongoing for quite some time, is the, um, a, the request that the public share any uh, comments they have regarding a next potential all pair model with CMMI. We are sharing any of those comments with AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the all pair model. And after that, all that, that's it. I will turn it back to you, board member Holmes. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Um, so the next item we have is the approval of the minutes from May 25th. So is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Great. Any discussion? <laughs> Not hearing any. Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes of May 25th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Not hearing any of that, so we can let the record show that we have uh, unanimous approval of the minutes by the board members here today. 
Uh, next up, we actually have the presentation of the vital uh, fiscal year 23 budget. I believe Jess Mendizabel, you are going to be kicking us off and setting the stage for us. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Just have a few slides and um, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jessica Mendizabel. I'm a member of the data team with the Green Mountain Care Board, and I've been working alongside um, VITAL the, this budget cycle to manage the process uh, as the board reviews the budget. And so just to remind everyone, the board does have statutory authority to review and approve the VITAL budget annually. This was granted to the board in 2015 and was implemented in 2016. And the, the main focus here is um, for the board's oversight to provide strategic guidance and policy parameters through which the administration will operationalize um, via a contract between VITAL and the Department of Vermont Health Access. In April of 2021, the board established an annual budget guidance for VITAL. The guidance has not changed this year, so um, the budget submission tracks to that guidance. And there are four principles that the board uses during its budget review. The first is transparency, which is measured by compliance with the budget guidance, as well as overall transparency for the budget process. We uh, have a public and stakeholder engagement process, which Susan mentioned, so we'll have a public comment period following today's presentation. The board also has to ensure that the budget submission aligns with the health information ex exchange or HIE plan goals and uh, ensure that the strategy and the priorities are consistent with the state's overall health care reform efforts, as well as the health information technology plan. And finally, um, the guidance established that the board's review process must be structured in a timely way to um, assist DIVA and VITAL in negotiating their um, contracts each year. And so um, just Susan mentioned a lot of this, so uh, just quick reference, we'll open the public comment period today. I will present to the board on June 22nd and there'll be a potential board vote that day. If additional information is required or additional discussion, we do have a backup date scheduled for June 29th. So all of these materials are available on our website, as well as historic materials from previous budget cycles. So uh, folks are encouraged to go and look at that um, after the presentation. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Beth Anderson, who is the president and CEO of VITAL. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I think Maureen is gonna share our content great um i'll just get i'll get started while she pulls those up um thank you to the board for having us here today to present our budget to you as you know the highlight for today will be our fy23 budget for the year starting july 1st but we're also going to present to you some um, information about work we have ongoing and just progress we've made this year the full leadership team is here with me and you'll hear from all of them at some point today. Um, so we have Bob Turnell, Christina Choquette, Maureen Gilbert, and Sue Fritz. And I think we're presenting in that order. Um, so Maureen, if you jump to slide four, please. Um, what I'd like to start is just a quick update for you on our CMS funding. So you may recall from updates we've given previously this year, the um, the state um, has submitted had submitted to CMS for the HIE to be certified as a component or a module of the Medicaid enterprise system here in Vermont. And we learned last month from CMS that that certification was actually uh, granted for us, which is really exciting. We're one of the first HIEs to receive this designation across the country. And it's a really good representation of our work. Um, it allows DIVA to continue to submit for ongoing operational funding of the VHI under their work with CMS. And it also allows them to request an enhanced um, funding participation from CMS, which will make the state's match, match dollars go further. Uh, so I think it's a really great testament to our work. 
just um, as a reminder, because it's been a while since we talked about that, you know, certification really involved our identifying measurable and reportable outcomes that demonstrate the work that we're doing and kind of represent our goals as a state for um, the work with HIE and Medicaid. And they, they went around really three categories of work. So one is would be measures of direct care and care coordination. Another is a measure of public health and the, the, uh, the support for public health needs. And the third is around value-based care and our work in support of that. And we will be providing updates that now for you going forward about what that what that looks like now that we've been awarded and we'll be pre presenting or calculating and presenting those metrics. Um, we've also learned some more about shifts in Medicaid funding availability. So as we talked last time we were here, um, high tech expired in the fall as we expected, unfortunately, and we were being funded through different Medicaid mechanisms and, and we're learning more about what those look like and how they will impact our work going forward. So there is more of a focus on operational funding and as opposed to the previous where we've seen some investment more in development work. Um, so you'll see that reflected in some of what we'll talk about today as we look to our 23 budget. Um, and we've learned that, unfortunately, CMS is no longer going to fund the creation of interfaces or connections between the HIE and healthcare organizations. So that's connections that would get the data into the HIE. So we um, we realize that this is a big kind of gap, our need for critical service for us really going forward. We're working with um, DIVA and some other stakeholders to, to come up with ways to really address that gap going forward. And we'll be talking to you more about that in future presentations. Um, so now before we start talking about our plans for 23, I wanted to just take a minute. I'm sorry, Maureen, next slide, please. Just wanted to take a minute to tell you a little bit about the work we've done in 22 and the current fiscal year and what we've achieved. <clears throat> so first is really around outcomes-based certification. Talk to you a bit about what that process was, but also that's um, changing a bit of the security focus of our work and formalizing some of our security. And Sue Fritz will talk to you a bit about that later in our presentation, um, but it's really taken us forward in some really good ways. Um, we ex continue to expand our work with the Department of Health in support of their needs. Um, that includes, we've, we've focused on developing a lot of new connections to get data for them around immunizations and lab results. We've expanded the work that we do with them to be outside of COVID um, and really to help support their work around other reportable diseases and other data needs, which has been really exciting. And the teams have been working to design an in, uh, integration between the immunization registry and the VHI, which will enable providers and healthcare organizations to have better um, point of care access to some of the immunization data that they need. Um, continue the implementation and enhancement of the collaborative services pro um, project and the implementation of the new clinical data repository, which Christina will touch a bit later. Um, we've launched a new clinical portal to replace the old one, which we're really excited about and getting good feedback about. Maureen will talk a bit about that. Um, we did work with Diva to actually represent that we could ingest claims data and link it to the clinical data and have a more even even more complete um, patient record, which included both their claims and clinical data. So that was really exciting um, capability for us. Um, Maureen has spent a lot of time preparing a new patient education campaign to really go out and remind them about their choice and how their data is shared and, and what that means for them. You'll also talk more about that. And then finally, you heard a little bit about this in a written update during the year, but I thought I'd take the opportunity while we're actually in conversation to talk about um, some strategic planning that the leadership team and the board of directors did early in 22 that's guiding much of our work. So if we turn to the next slide, um, the, the strategic planning work really developed a strategic framework for us to use to guide our work in the coming years and really set a foundation for from our work. And at its core, we set five strategic directions around the, the work. And I won't read all of the, the language on the slides, but just to hit the top, the top points, it's really for us to focus on our customers and their needs and their wants. Um, to tell our story, to make sure people understand what the VHI can provide to them and what services are available, um, to be the go-to partner for exchanging Vermont's health information, to build a learning organization, and to ensure sustainability of the VHI so that we can continue to do our work and deliver to the healthcare community here. All of this is really founded on what we've set out as kind of a security um, goal for us, which is really that all of our work is dependent on and must must focus on the security of the patient data, ensuring the appropriate access to the data, and ensuring that we honor the patient's rights and preferences. So that's really a long-term commitment of ours. Um, 
And so this strategic plan, which is more of an internal to vitals work, combined with the HIE strategic plan, which you are all aware of that you saw in November, really is drives our priorities and plans for each fiscal year. And you'll see that represented as we talk about what we're looking at with the FY23 budget as well. So on the next slide, um, it lays out what, what it, our actually calendar year 23 contract with DIVA is likely to look like. So this is based on our conversations and, and um, agreements with the team at AHS right now, which um, as, as we do every year, we have these initial conversations to inform our budget process, but this actually will not be approved by CMS until the fall. So we'll come back to you when we have that final approval of the contract and let you know that that has happened. But what the thinking is, is that the contract will be about 7.2 million. And you'll see, as I mentioned earlier, this really reflects the transition away from platform development and implementation and really towards ongoing maintenance and operations of the existing platform. Um, you will see that there is a bit of funding there for interfaces. We will not be using CMS dollars, as mentioned, for, for interfaces. However, the Department of Health wants to make sure that we can continue to at least um, focus on the interfaces that they need for labs and immunization data. So they will be using different funding sources to fund some of that work for us going into the, the next calendar year. There's also a bit of money for us to continue the integration of the immunization registry and the BHI, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I think we're, um, you know, this leaves us in a good place. I think the, 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 the good part of the story is, you know, we had these conversation last year and we weren't sure what the CMS dollars would look like or how, how significant of a change it would be. It's not, um, I think we've been happy that we are, we're in a better place than we thought we would be, but we still uh, like, we'll be looking to the future to figure out different ways to continue to deliver new services and products for the healthcare community. So the next slide we'll lay out for you, as you know, you know we're, we're, Bob will be in a moment presenting the FY23 budget for you, which actually is a combination of work from our current calendar year contract, the CY22 contract, and this new calendar year 23 contract I just presented. So just to give you a sense of what projects are represented in the budget we'll present, separate from how we've presented it from a contract year. Um, the work that we anticipate will happen would be one, ensuring patients have access to their health data and delivering some of the new what are called application programming interfaces or APIs that CMS and OMC are encouraging to be built so patients can use third party apps, a thing like Apple Health, to get their data from the VHI. We'll be updating the platform to the newest standard of the, the FHIR, the Fast Healthcare Interface Resource. Interface resource um, tool and standard just so we are keeping current. Um, we will continue some enhancements to the new clinical portal, which will deliver on some of the needs and wants of the healthcare community. Um, we're going to continue working on our reporting and extract um, capabilities so we can continue to make data and data sets available um, to individuals who need it. So that's for work like with Blueprint and OneCare and potentially others that might want data. Um, as I mentioned a couple of times, the immunization registry integration will continue. Um, we're also doing some strategic planning with the Department of Public Health over the next um, six to eight months to think about, in addition to immunization registry, where are other opportunities for us to integrate our work, to use the VHI to support their work, um, to make sure we're not duplicating efforts and making sure the data is available where people need it. Um, be doing some work with Medicaid um, to help meet some of their interoperability needs. So the same way that we are trying to make patient data available through APIs, they also have that requirement to make the claims data available. So we'll be doing some work to help them in that work. Um, and then we will be continuing, as I mentioned, to do interfaces for public health. Some activities we'll have that are represented in our budget but aren't necessarily aligned with the state or funded through the state contract will be, um, you've heard this from us, I think, for a couple of years now, really expanding our outreach and client engagement. So making sure we're like talking with the healthcare community, understanding their needs and what their challenges are and opportunities for the VHI to support their work. Um, refining our product roadmap as we have those conversations to make sure that we're delivering services that are actually valuable to them and that they want. And some of that will really be some exploring opera, some specific opportunities this year. And one is how do we get more of the VHI data into their health records directly? So it really is at their fingertips at the point of care and not requiring other tools and access. Um, and also a program with the NCQA 
to help with some of the supplemental data needed for HEDIS reporting that would be um, a real operational benefit to both payers and providers to avoid some of the manual data um, collection and extraction that happens now. So hopefully you'll be hearing more from us on those programs over the, the coming months as well. And so with that foundation, I'm happy to answer any questions or to turn it over to Bob to talk you through the numbers. Do board members have any questions for Beth? I have a couple questions, but I can hold them to the end like we normally do if you prefer. What would you like? Up to you, Beth. It's, it's fine by me to hold till the, till the end. So why don't we hold till the end, unless Beth, you feel like you'd prefer to answer questions. Not unless it's you know if it's something that would be helpful for you to have as a foundation answered now. Happy to answer anything. Okay. All right. Why don't we hold unless somebody has a clarifying question, and then we'll hold all the questions till the end. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bob Turneau. CFO of Vital, and I'll be present uh, presenting uh, the FY23 uh, budget this afternoon. Next slide, please. As we close out FY22, we are forecasting better performance than planned, um, as shown by the increase in net assets uh, compared with budget. Um, and our, we believe that our balance sheet will remain uh, robust through the end of the year. Uh, next slide. As Beth has mentioned, FY23 really represents a year of transition as we complete development projects and we move from the legacy VHI um, platform to the new data platform. Um, Next slide, please. This chart is a comparative of the statement of activities by year. Um, the elements of this chart will be discussed in upcoming charts. Overall, the FY23 budget has a positive change in net asset at year end, and our cash position will be uh, strong at the end of the year. Next slide. This chart details revenue by year by source. And as noted, the CY23 value is an estimate and that's based on our discussions with DIVA um, prior to uh, putting together the budget. Um, this value may change prior to um, award of the contract in uh, the beginning of the new year. Um, but it is our best estimate with um, consensus with DIVA program managers. Next slide, please. This chart shows the portion of expense by type in the FY23 budget. The largest items of the expense are labor at 35%, software at 31% and outside support at 20%. Um, in prior years, outside support has been one of our largest um, elements of cost. And again, as we transition um, in scope, um, that has gone down by about $200,000. Next slide, please. Overall spend for labor related costs is less than a little less than $200,000 less than uh, more than uh, the FY22 year end forecast. This um, includes the creation of three roles, but at the same time, um, shifting two roles, vacant roles uh, to outside support for FY23. And finally, it includes a COLA of 3% and um, a contingency for potential increased health insurance cost of around $20,000. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. This chart provides a detail on software and outside support. Um, comparing software support, I mean software to um, FY22, um, it is up $92,000, um, which reflects kind of a mix, if you will, of um, really capturing all the cost of um, some of the functionality, um, which began in October of 2021. So this would have a full year of, of all the software licensing costs. Um, as I mentioned, outside support is down by about $200,000. Um, as again, um, projects draw to a close in, in this fiscal year. Next slide, please. Vital is um, a lean organization and um, our continued staffing strategy has been to fill, to not fill short-term specialized roles with employees, but rather with consultants. Um, so we, we have held back on um, filling some roles um, with employees, but rather we've gone out because the skills are um, specialized and are a one-time need. Any questions on that? Next slide. Indirect rates. Vital has worked hard over the years to keep our indirect costs in check. Um, as a small company though, small changes in volume and expense also uh, will drive shifts in the, in the rate. Um, next slide. Balance sheet. We project at the end of FY23 uh, that we will be in a strong cash position at the end of the year. Um, with 172 days of cash. Next slide. Finally, Vital plans on using some of its FY22 surplus to support an internal effort to redesign the Rhapsody integration engine with the um, intent to improve the efficiency of this tool. Um, so um, that concludes my portion of the um, FY23 budget presentation. Are there any questions that I can address? I think maybe we'll just hold any questions until the end, Bob, if that's all right with uh, the rest of the board. Very good. So I will turn it over to Maureen Gilbert, our Director of Client Engagement. Thanks, Bob. So I'm going to talk briefly about our development of a sustainability model. So Beth was talking earlier about the transition to new federal funding sources and um, shifts in the state's funded priorities and Vital's need to continue to define a sustainable fee structure. And by sustainable, I mean sustainable for both Vital and for its, its clients. And the goal here is to allow the organization first off to continue building new connections with organizations who want to submit data and um, to continue receiving data from organizations when they change EHRs, which is a, a frequent occurrence. Um, this is essential. We need data in in order to um, make this, this tool, make the Vermont Health Information Exchange useful to the healthcare community in Vermont. And we're looking for our sustainability model to help support that. Additionally, we know that the needs of healthcare organizations are changing all the time. Healthcare organizations, whether they're defined as um, hospitals, practices, payers, um, we, we group a number of different types of organizations providing healthcare services. 
under that heading, and we know their needs are rapidly evolving. And in order to keep providing value to them, it's important that we invest in customer-led design and that we are able to implement new services to support actionable data, for instance, by providers at the point of care. So those are the key goals of our sustainability model and our ongoing development of, of that. Certainly something that we'll be talking about a lot more in the, in the months and year to come. And after that, I'm going to move on to our program updates. I'm going to pass it for a minute over to Christina Choquet, our Director of Operations. Hi, everyone. I am Christina Choquet. I'm the Director of Operations, as Maureen mentioned. I might look familiar to some of you. I'm pleased to be back and delivering the MedicaSoft overall project update. Um, so to start, um, where we are with the MedicaSoft project really can be seen as um, a period where we're fully transitioning onto the new platform from our legacy uh, vendor, um, hitting a period of uh, stabilization onto that new platform and leveraging um, some of the great things that are available uh, to Vital and to our stakeholders on that new platform. So to begin, um, we have uh, rolled out our Vital Access Clinical Portal pilot. That is the portal that is available to providers to access the data. It's using an API to actually hit the clinical data repository and present that data. And um, Maureen will talk about that uh, immediately following about that rollout effort. 90% of the interfaces, which is now as of today, 93% of the interfaces uh, that needed to be moved from uh, the legacy platform directly to the new platform. That transition is underway and we are um, focusing on getting that done um, in the June, July timeframe. We have selected and are in the process of finalizing a contract with our results delivery and direct messaging vendor. And uh, the announcement is it will be with Health Catalyst, who was our legacy vendor. I, I think um, we're all surprised about that decision. Um, but at the end of the day, after uh, coming down to three vendors in the running, it really came down to uh, Health Catalyst has two really solid services that we already know that our clients are already using. It was the least disruption for our clients using those solid services, especially with results delivery, um, knowing that that vendor was able to integrate right into the EHR and, and support the current workflow that many providers have um, really tipped um, the, the decision in their favor. And so we are signing a one-year renewable contract with them. Um, so that will allow us to also determine what do our clients needs um, back to what Maureen was saying, really having this customer led design, what is it that they would need a year from now and where is the market for us to either renew um, or to consider an, another platform. The reporting database, um, once the clinical data is stored into our clinical um, uh, repository, it then moves into the reporting database, and that's what we have used to deliver the two blueprint ex extracts to date, um, successfully deliver two blueprint extracts to date, and we're working on fine-tuning the performance and availability of that data, uh, looking forward for when we can provide views into that data and some self-service tools um, for our stakeholders to use in addition to extracting data. 
And then we have some really exciting projects underway for fall delivery. Um, and uh, Beth has already touched upon the, the uh, patient API. So that would enable uh, a Vermont patient to actually have access to their own data using a third party application. Um, and we're working with uh, our state counterparts in order to leverage some of the existing infrastructure if possible for identity management and authorization uh, for uh, Vermonters to access that data. Um, not listed here is also working with the Medicaid interoperability to enable uh, Medicaid patients to also have data. So we're working with Medicaid to share the data for their API needs. And we're working on a technical design for uh, the social determinants of health uh, to enable data ingestion using the Gravity Project as our framework. Um, we're putting together a repeatable process to be able to ingest that data and have it available for use as needed. And lastly, we're working with the Vermont Department of Health in order to implement a bi-directional immunization query and, re and retrieve technical design. It's two phases. The first phase will be to integrate with the uh, uh, immunization registry so that providers would be able to access and view the uh, immunizations that are uh, in the registry themselves. And then phase two would be the ability to present forecasting information. Uh, so when a provider needs to know what immunizations need to be administered and when they would have that information available as well. So really exciting things happening on the Medicasoft front. And at this moment, I'll turn it over back to Maureen. Thanks, Christina. Sure. All right, so Christina and her team did a tremendous job standing up the vital access provider portal. Um, this is something that uh, we did in really close collaboration between the um, operations team, the engagement team, the technology team, um, and our clients. So Christina mentioned a pilot that we did earlier, and we talked a little bit about that last time we were here. We are now rolling out to um, to users beyond that, that pilot group. That rollout began on April 19th, and it continues in waves. We're doing it in a way that requires um, the least uh, disruption for for the organizations where vital access is used. So we are reaching out directly to users. We are certainly letting leaders at their organizations know about this and asking for their support and encouraging the transition and encouraging use. But the first step is this outreach directly to users, inviting them to activate their new accounts, building awareness of education resources and encouraging use of the portal. We've got live trainings happening regularly. We have a learning hub with a user manual, quick videos, um, recorded webinars, and more. And our support team has been um, working hard to define an approach to, to supporting user needs and answering user questions and has been, in fact, getting a lot of user questions and answering a lot of user questions. They're a great resource for our users. From those users, we've heard really positive feedback about the new interface and the data that's available there. Hearing that it's more intuitive, more like an electronic health record organized in terms of the clinical data that's needed at point of care. And there's important new data sources in there like immunizations, for, for example. Um, there were some questions um, from the board in reviewing our materials about how the rollout is progressing. It's progressing steadily. Um, we are seeing steadily increased um, uh, patient chart queries in the new portal and steadily decreased patient chart queries in the old portal. And I am thinking next week is the point when it crosses over. The, the uh, lines are converging, and I think we're about to see more use of the new one than the old one. We're also going to be doing a big push to get everybody um, to make that transition before we do finally close out the old portal. 
and then we'll we'll develop plans for ongoing support of use and ongoing user user feedback mechanisms so that we can continue to evolve this tool to meet user needs. The next thing I wanted to talk to you about is our patient consent education. I feel like every time I've been here since I've taken this job, I've said, hey, you know, we've had to put this on hold because of the pandemic or the next wave of the pandemic um, and, and the recognition that there are a lot of health messages out in the world and a lot of very important ones. We think now is the time to be relaunching our patient consent education efforts, um, doing direct outreach to Vermonters. This will begin this month. Um, there will be paid placement on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, um, sort of brief pre-roll videos. And the goal here is, is building views and awareness. So it's not actually asking anybody to take a very specific action, but we just want to build awareness of health record data sharing and make sure people have access to um, opting out should they, should they choose to, or um, in, in most patients, in the case of most patients, we find that when they learn about this, what they want to do is they want to stay in and they want to keep sharing their record. This will supplement ongoing education by participating organizations, um, and we continue to support that through a toolkit of resources for our clients. And we will be reaching out to um, partners, both um, clients and um, community partners, including the ones who were part of the original um, opt out switch um, consent education and letting them know about the resources so that they have the opportunity to um, post, repost, share this content that we've developed to help support um, education of Vermonters about health data sharing. So there are folks in the in the audience today who can expect to hear from me on this. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sue Fritz, our director of technology. Thanks, Maureen. Um, so I wanted to bring you a little update on our security um, program here at Vital. There's so much to talk about when we talk about security, but I could don't assume the rest of you want to spend the rest of the afternoon with me. So I took some high level bullet points, but also welcome you to ask any questions if you had them. Um, the the big bullet points that I brought to bringing you today is is kind of the culmination of security assessments and tests that we do. So in January, we finished up our or we did a penetration test with a third party vendor that was mostly success, successful. There were absolutely no critical vulnerabilities and everything that was noted was um, um, mitigated in in the follow up session that we did with the vendor. Um, during February, we uh, conducted disaster recovery tabletop tests. Um, this was kind of an escalated effort that came as part of the CMS certification funding. Um, normally, we would be doing disaster recovery testing every year, um, but this one was a tabletop test that we did during the uh, at the request of CMS during the 90-day um, feedback period. We met with each of the vendors. We ran through the disaster recovery playbooks with them, um, kind of half um, mocked the exercise by saying, okay, this is how I would perform this step. Each member of the team would perform the step, maybe show, show um, the steps on the screen to the rest of the team, um, that type of thing. Um, we do plan to um, go through, follow up these tests with full-blown tests as the life cycle continues here. Um, but the tabletop tests were, were a good practice, made sure everybody understood what their exact um, role in the disaster recovery um, was and um, highly successful. Um, another thing that's now part of the CMS evolution that we have going on here is this concept of system security planning. So we have a really robust security program following the NIST 800, you know, 53 or the NIST CFS platform. But as we move into the new funding sources through CMS, our framework for doing security has to change. And one of those big pieces is a system security plan, which is a very formalized, thorough document that outlines every single security control that you have across your infrastructure. So we uh, started by creating the overall or overarching policy for creating and maintaining that system security plan. Um, 
as it's, it's not only something that Vital needs to do, but it's something that each of our vendors need to do, and then we need to combine it together into uh, a combined system security plan. So we wrote that basic high-level architectural policy to guide the process, and in the upcoming months, we will start digging into actually pulling together the system security plan itself. Um, and then finally, just now, we are finishing up our annual security assessment, which is um, our partner Synergistic that's coming in, to, that has come in, um, assessed our security program as it sits right now, and is finalizing um, that assessment. And we have a workshop next week to uh, review it and um, update our uh, security planning for the next year. Um, so in a very high level set of steps, that's basically where we are right now. Thanks, Sue. All right, so I'll take, um, take the mic back just one more time and walk you through our quarterly metrics. And I'll focus here really on the, the notable changes um, to these metrics. So each time we present to you or share a report with you, we talk about the number of patients opted out of the Vermont Health Information Exchange, wanting to make sure that, that some patients are continuing to opt out as a signal that that option is clear to people. Um, we know that it's most people's preference to stay in, but we do want to honor um, the preference of opting out. That rate did go down a little bit in the period between March and April, and this is due to a, a large new um, set of patient information that we imported into the Vermont Health Information Exchange, mostly historical data from a large COVID testing laboratory. So anytime we get a really big group of new patients, um, it tends to decrease the opt-out rate a, a little bit from where it was historically. Next up is um, queries of vital access by organization type. And here we're reporting on the legacy vital access portal. You can see that most, um, the, the biggest user is a, a federal state agency. Um, and in this case, VDH makes up the most of that number. Um, and you also see good use at hospitals um, and in independent practices. One of the questions that, that you all had, which I didn't touch on earlier, was um, who do we think will continue to, or who uses the portal rather than getting their data uh, in their EHR? And also, um, what do we expect to see for portal use over time, um, long-term use of the portal? So um, this is a good look at the types of organizations that, that use the portal. Right now, we don't have an option for viewing Vermont Health Information Exchange data in your EHR with two exceptions. One is results delivery, which is very specifically a provider order to test and is getting a result back. Um, the other is eHealth Exchange queries of the portal that happens, um, or queries of the Vermont Health Information Exchange that returns documents, so large summaries of a patient's health history, um, and that is used right now by the VA, DOD, and UVM. We are actively looking right now at options for making um, access to Vermont Health Information Exchange data easier from within um, organizations' electronic health records. And we think that there's going to be the most interest in that um, at hospitals, possibly at FQHCs, um, perhaps at independent practices with um, sophisticated IT uh, programs and the ability to in invest there. We think vital access is going to continue being essential. Um, the actual web portal is going to continue to be essential to many other organizations, including um, the Vermont Department of Health, including emergency medical services, which do use um, the portal today. Um, smaller practices, we get quite a lot of reliance on the portal from, for instance, on naturopaths. Um, so smaller independent practices, um, alternative and complementary medicine practices. There's a, a range of types of organizations that are apt to be users of the web portal in the long term rather than ingesting data into an EHR. This is vital access queries by month. Um, 
the the drop that you're seeing here is not yet the drop in uh, it, it's not related to the launch of the new portal because that was really begun um, the full rollout in April. That drop reflects decreased Vermont Department of Health use and decreased engagement with the portal around COVID specifically. So really, this is a good news story. We have seen lots of interest from VDH and lots more use in using it for, for other purposes. We're actively exploring um, permitted uh, health, um, public health purpose use of the, um, the portal. And so there's a diversity of uses um, at, that we expect ongoing from the Department of Health, but it's not going to be the volume that it was during COVID. And I think that's something we can all be um, grateful for. And then you will see at the bottom uh, use of the new provider portal. And what you see there is uh, use in February and March when we were piloting. March was really when the pilot was in full swing. And then um, in April piloting and then launch beginning April 19th. So what this story is for me, this is about um, our commitment to piloting and getting user feedback um, and building that into our, our new tool. This chart shows queries of the Vermont Health Information Exchange via eHealth Exchange, primarily from the Medical Center and the VA and DOD. Results delivery by results type. This is a fairly consistent story from what you've seen all along. So um, primarily laboratory results, some radiology reports, and some transcribed reports or notes um, sent into electronic health records to 599 providers right now are receiving results in their electronic health records through the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And then this is who's relying on results delivery. And this is very clearly our federally qualified health centers and our independent practices who are using this to get results from um, hospitals mostly. And that's all. So I'll, I'll stop sharing now and ask if anybody has questions about the presentation. Great, thank you so very much. Um, I guess, yeah, I'll open it up to any board questions. I'll go ahead and jump in. Hi everyone, this is Robin. Um, so I had a, a couple of questions related to um, the future planning around funding, which I know, uh, as you stated in your materials, it's premature to go deep on right now. Uh, but I thought it might be helpful to just kind of uh, share some of my questions now and um, so that you, as you're developing information, you'll have this uh, in advance. So I think for me, what would be super helpful in thinking about this as we move forward is understanding uh, in more detail how the shift in CMS funding impacts core services and operations. So in, for example, uh, prior budget presentations and potentially even in the HIE plan, there's graphics that sort of show the core services um, that we as a state were, were trying to really focus on with VITAL. Um, and so having an understanding of which of which of those things are still able to be funded under the new CMS uh, rules and which are not. You've obviously given a, a good example today about the interfaces. So for example, with the interfaces, what would be helpful to understand moving forward is before it was funded X amount for Y amount of interfaces. I know you actually typically exceeded your uh, your minimum, so what you were typically able to do with current staffing. So that kind of gives us that gap. Obviously, some of that might be the public health interfaces, so that needs to be backed out. But really getting, just using that as an example, um, for each area that where there's now a funding gap from the state, understanding that with a little more depth um, so that we can, so that we have a better understanding of what kind of private sources might be necessary to support that. Interfaces, I think, is obviously a necessary area since if providers aren't connecting, there's no data, and without the data, there's really no point, <laughs> not to put too fine a, a point on it. But um, so, and I think I did 
raised this issue in the HIE planning uh, approval in the fall that I do come at the funding from thinking about vital as a really as a public utility model. And so um, I am particularly interested in understanding the private funding components um, because I want to make sure that we're maintaining that the appropriate public utility components. So, um, so I think for me, what would be really important is making sure that we're building in checkpoints or ways that we can we can stay informed on that, um, because part of what we have to assess is how this compares to the HIE plan. And then when we get the new HIE plan, I would assume that that will have some more information about public versus private funding in that balance. Um, so sorry to talk at you so much, but I just wanted to kind of share my thinking so that as you're um, getting more information, you can uh, be having that in the back of your mind. Um, so that was really the major point that I wanted to just express. Um, and let me just look at my notes real quick. Yeah, no, I think that really covers sort of my major area of interest um, moving forward to make sure that we really have an understanding of how that funding change will impact your work and um, how to ensure that we're uh, appropriately looking at that before anything is implemented. Yeah, that um, I won't answer your questions, but just to respond um, that it's really helpful to understand how you want to think about it. And that is um, that is how we've been kind of trying to ground the conversations that we've been having with the team at DIVA and AHS is really looking at the plan and the foundational and what's changed. So we will absolutely come back and try to frame it in that same way. So it makes sense and, and is clear going forward. Thank you. Great. Any other board members? Tom or Tom, do you have questions? Uh, I, I have a couple. I think they're easy ones, but uh, um, if we could go to slide 12, if you could put slide 12 up. Almost there. There you go. So just a, a couple of line items here that caught my eye, and uh, they might just be issues of, of of moving work, you know, forward from 22 to 23, et cetera. But I'm looking at network expenses and seeing the variance between the approved budget and the year-end forecast. And that variance on network expenses is a is a 39% decrease. And I'm just wondering what drives that and right below it moving to um, occupancy, um, that decrease is a 37% decrease. And just wondering, you know, what's behind that? Bob, do you want to take those or do you want me to? Um, if you want to, take no, them, that'd please. be great. Um, I mean, certainly the occupancy, Tom, uh, that reflects um, the impact of our move from uh, the Chase Mill, which we affected in um, March of this year, actually February, to um, Blair Park in Williston. We went from a 7,000 square foot um, office in the Chase Mill to 1,500 square feet. Um, and that had um, really a material effect on on our occupancy cost. So that's in, a that 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 that's a, a an embedded reduction and that 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 will stay going forward. Um it I'll, I'll I answer guess, that. I think yeah, for the better. near future, yeah. I think for the near future that is our intent. We're working remotely. I'm not saying that there isn't a point in the future where we decide a different hybrid mixture of uh, on-site and remote won't change, but our intent for now is is for this to remain. Correct. Yeah. And um, in terms of, uh, 
I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of in term of network expenses, um, that the shift that you see is um, the increase in um, data security expenses associated with um, the CMS certification um, between uh, the two years. Okay. 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 Um, and then I think a little bit later, I don't think we need to go to the, go to the, uh, the page, but there was, uh, there was a screen that talked about two, um, positions were, um, moved to out, um, outside support. So it sounded like you had two ver vacancies internally and, um, you moved, something moved to outside support. And yeah. just wondering uh, what that was about. We have um, two positions, one being a database um, and analytics focused role and one being a spa programmer with some very specific skills with some of our tools that we did have um, individuals leave during the year. Um, and given where we are in the transition from the old platform to the new platform and really trying to build up our skills and capabilities on the new platform, we've decided that filling those roles, at least for the short term, next you know, eight months or whatever makes more sense for us to pay for really skilled consultants to help us think about what we need to do and what our going forward looks like than with the intent of defining the job descriptions that we need as permanent staff after that. And we don't think we'll need the same level of skills for the long term. So I certainly didn't want to bring expensive people in and lay people off in, in a year. And so it's really to help us transition, gap this transition on the platforms and, and learn what we need to do. And two other quick ones, um, relative to kind of the, the patient consent education, um, and I've, I've asked this before and I still worry about it. Um, we have uh, our kind of you know, building into our your capabilities, the uh, social determinants of health. And um, I have yet to see a list of what those data points are. And so I'm wondering when you go out to talk to patients about consent, what will they be told about, um, you know, the, the the progress and the kind of inclusiveness of um, social determinants of health as to what those data points are that will be added to what what you make available? Sure. So I think there's two ways for us to think about the social determinants of health, or two types of social determinants of health we should be thinking about. One is the um, social determinants of health that are collected by healthcare providers, where the information is collected by healthcare providers. So that might mean, for instance, a hunger vital sign screening that many primary care providers are implementing. Now that's shared just like all of the rest of the information in the medical record. Um, we are, are certainly working on how, how to share that information back out um, because it's a little less standardized than, for instance, a, a blood pressure reading. Um, I think we can do more to let folks know that all of their medical record from their primary care and their hospital visits are, are potentially shared, um, including those. I don't know that there would be an expectation of that type of thing being left out. Um, I think where the question gets um, harder and where we need to do more um, thinking and engagement going forward is when it's social determinants of health collected somewhere else besides a doctor's office. And we um, are right now, Christina talked about the work to plan for technical ingestion of that type of data. Um, I think there is also work that needs to be done around data governance, um, when it is appropriate to share it with the health information exchange, when it is appropriate for the health information exchange to share it back out, and what sort of um, patient consent uh, needs to be honored there, and then how we communicate with patients about it. I think there's a lot of work before we get to how we communicate with patients about that second type of social determinant of health. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's clearly a work in progress, but I just worry mm -hmm. that at some point in time, the, you know, um, we went, we went through, you folks went through a great job of um, getting people going from opt, uh, opting in to opting out 
um, that whole transition. I just worry that that you know with, that the social determinants of health will become as a surprise to people as opposed to something um, and 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 un unnecessarily surprise, but just that it's not something that that it's it's it, it, it's a new piece of new set of data out there that that uh, isn't isn't ingrained in the system at this point in time. Just a worry. And one more question, you don't have to go to it, but I will go to, for example, on, so I'm not looking at you now, I'm looking at this chart on, on slide 30, where you have legacy um, queries by organization type. And I'm wondering in terms of kind of growing your portfolio, whether within those organization types, you have um, captured a certain portion of them and whether or not it's possible to leverage growth by having the portion that you've engaged with um, uh, communicate to the portion that 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 aren't aligned with you to kind of you know grow the totality of your engagement with those types of of organizations. Yes, absolutely. And there's there's two ways that we we do that. Um, one is by um, every time we go to an organization that is looking to increase their use or where we think there's opportunity for increased use, we look for clinical champions. So we either find ones if they're already there or ask people to, to try it out and see how it's working for them and then become the evangelists for the tool um, because nobody listens um, to... <laughs> How do I say this? Uh, doctors listen to other doctors a lot more closely than they listen to me, and that's as it should be. Um, so <laughs> we um, really do look for clinical champions. The other thing is that we um, we have very clear guidelines for use, treatment, payment, operations. Within that, there are a lot of new um, use cases, ways to use the tool that are being discovered every every day. Um, so for instance, there are hospitals that are using this to do um, patient matching work to help clean up their own records because we have a little bit more information than, than they do about past addresses, for instance. Um, there are um, hospitals who are using this to help verify that it's appropriate to give a, a proxy access to a, a record. And those are things that um, Sometimes they're they're discovered by somebody in one hospital or practice or organization, and then we can bring that as an idea to other ones and say, hey, have you thought about this this use? So absolutely, there is opportunity for growth within each of these organizations, and we look for champions and we look for new uses and help spread the word. Well, thank you very much. I just want to applaud you all for the kind of progress over the years in terms of the budget presentation and that, it, you know, I'm finding it crisp and clear and, uh, and also successful. And so it's, um, um, it's just, it's, it, it's, uh, it's good to have you before us. And I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. But this is uh, the other Tom, <laughs> um, the, the, the new, um, Tom, if you will. And so um, I've just got a couple questions and some of it you can just tell me if I'm off the mark on what you're aiming to be um, doing. Um, but a couple things that came up from listening to the presentation. Um, the kind of first and simplest, the, the last few slides that you showed that showed utilization over time, um, that was just for like the last year. And um, in future presentations, showing longer horizons would be helpful to me. Um, but beyond that, I'm really interested in the medical soft part of the presentation and the work with Health Catalyst. Um, I'm, I, I don't think it's very familiar, but I'm quite familiar with what they, they do. And, and I was wondering if, um, you could say a little bit more about, there was a comment that it was somewhat of a surprise to land with them again. And I'd just like to understand that a little bit more. Um, what was, uh, what were the deciding features with, with using them? Yeah, I can, do you want me to take that Beth or do you want to start? Yeah. Can I give a piece of context and then sure. let you fill in the details? Is that yes. okay, Tom? Because Tom, I, I um, 
going to give you a little bit of background that you probably don't have because we haven't presented live in a while. Um, is we are transitioning from our full HIE clinical data repository platform from the Health Catalyst system to the Medicasoft system, which is a fire native platform. So a very different technical capability for us. And, and so we have been looking at some of the components that we had with Health Catalyst to see how we replace some of the components that work off of that platform. So just so you understand the context for those comments, and then I think Christina can talk through some of the details. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so um, after moving toward this new platform, uh, we went out to market to find out who could provide the best results delivery and um, web mail HISP product for us. And obviously, Health Catalyst was still interested in maintaining a relationship with us and two other vendors that we compared. And it really did come down to, at the end of the day, although we moved to the Medicasoft platform because of its fire capabilities and modernization to be able to um, have APIs on top of that data and extract the data easily, we still really came down to the conclusion that all along we did have two solid results delivery and HISP choices um, and having a conversation with Health Catalyst and where they're heading with some of their products in those areas was was intriguing to us. And, and really that tipping point was the least amount of impact to our clients who were already happy with those services, right? Why change horses midstream? And that direct integration into the EHR. So yeah. those were those were really the critical points. Thank you for that. And some of the kind of the emerging um, tools that work through API and through these type of vendors, um, I wonder if there's been discussion, if you've had discussion about incorporating patient reported outcomes that um, if you're talking about engaging with patients, whether it's with consent or with shared decision making, collecting any type of, of general health perception in patients over time, and then being able to provide that to clinicians um, when they arrive for their appointment. Is that something that you all have talked about at all with your services, or am I missing the mark with what you're, what you're doing? I think we'll all have a piece of an answer here, yeah. but no, it's, I mean, it's definitely something we're talking about. We're talking with um, some of the providers particularly within some of the hospitals or the larger centers, like thinking about wearables, both the wearables they send patients home with, as well as the wearables patients choose to have like a Fitbit or something. And, and how do we think about that data and incorporating it? And I don't have answers for you today, except to know that this is on the radar and things that we're absolutely talking about. Terrific. Yeah, it, it's even... Um simpler than like the, the wearables, just asking, there's some good evidence, it's now quite old, but it's been replicated a bit, just asking a, an individual, how's your health today? How is it compared to six months ago? And that question about six months ago, if the patient reports they're feeling their health is declining, um, that's a very powerful indicator of they're, they're not doing well. And bringing that information to providers can um, can help with the the hot spotting and assessment assessment of rising risk in a patient population, um, and um, adding that with the social determinants of health information um, is is a really powerful thing for clinicians. That's what when I was seeing patients, we we're always trying to build this type of capability. And um, having the individual's perception of their health, their neighborhood characteristics, um, you know, being able to answer a question, a, a provider being able to um, query a data set with questions like, what proportion of my patients with diabetes have an A1C level greater than nine, so they're quite sick, um, and have not been seen in the past six months who live in a food desert area with poor transformation. If I add that in, that they're telling me they're feeling sicker, that's a person that's likely to be admitted and have undergo very expensive care. 
And if I can intervene earlier, I can save that admittance. But having tools that present that type of data to me is difficult and, and requires a lot of interface with different and integration, the type that you're describing. Um, so that helps me understand. Um, another piece that it can be really powerful that Health Catalyst I know had done a lot of work with and it seems to have gone away and I don't know why, but they had a cost allocation tool that could be used by provider systems, a service line cost allocation tool that helped a provider system understand the cost of caring for an individual with a condition. And, and that is a, a really powerful piece of information as well. Um, because most of our conversations are around charges and reimbursement and people are afraid that if they're not being reimbursed what they've charged, they might be losing money. But it's not until they understand their cost that they can make a difference. Most places don't have cost allocation tools. So if there's a system that um, we can bring those tools to people, that could be helpful. Again, I don't know if that's part of your purview or what you're interested in doing later on, but with the technology that you outlined, it's possible. Um, I will say, and somebody, again, the rest of the team can comment, like it, this is something we haven't heard much about, but as I mentioned, very, as just a bullet point earlier, something that we really do intend to do this year is much more outreach and engagement with the healthcare organizations to understand like what they want to achieve. So it's something we can ask about and 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 listen for whether they're wanting tools like this and if there's an opportunity that's, that yeah, is helpful. With, with value-based reimbursement, when there's a, a set amount, a capitated amount or a bundled amount, the cost allocation tool helps the organization understand their cost of care to be sure that their costs are below the capitated amount so they maintain their margin. And without those type of tools, they can't really do those calculations. Yeah. So a way to bring that service and tool to um, providers, especially smaller ones, um, is, is very powerful. Yeah, that makes sense, thank you. Well, thank you. And Great, thank you. Tom, are you set? Yes. Okay, great, Thanks. thank you. Um, you know, I just have one question, um, and then I want to definitely open it up for public comment if there is any. But, you know, I think about so much that we can learn from COVID and from, you know, going through this pandemic and in many ways, you know, the critical need for data during a pandemic. And you mentioned, um, you know, BDH was thinking about other potential public health uses. And I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what those potential uses might be, where we might go, what we learned from COVID. I can. I think we can mention a few things, and just um, but to set the foundation is we are actually um, working to identify a consultant with really experience in this work of the integration of what what's possible with HIE and public health to help us do some strategic planning. So really to push us and help um, raise some ideas. But thoughts that come. I mean, some are very straightforward. Using the Marie mentioned a bit, using the provider portal for some of their other work. Where else is some of that data useful? Um, even just other reportable diseases, because COVID isn't the only thing that happens. Um, things like electronic case reporting um, and surveillance. So you know, if we're getting the data in a timely manner, can we help identify trends that otherwise require manual reporting or and timeliness of that reporting? Um, it could be um, better integration with some vital records. Right now we get the death registry data and make that available, but there may be some other opportunities, birth, birth things like that. Um, and I, you know, I, I do think like as we really dig in and engage with the teams, we'll identify some new opportunities. I will say like we've, it's been really um, exciting as we have these, you know, as public health, as they get their hands on these tools and see the data, the things that they come up with and the thoughts that the teams have once they see what's possible. So I think we'll probably surprise ourselves with some ideas that come out of this. Great, so many promising uses. I'm anxious to hear about how that unfolds. 
Um, I think at this point, are there any other board questions? Everybody feel? Oh, go ahead, I have Rob. just one other um, one other area uh, that occurred to me as as I was listening to others ask questions. Um, in terms of this, you had mentioned the social determinants of health bill that you're working on uh, for fall delivery. I'm assuming that's uh, using the DIVA contract money from um, like the existing CMS funding scheme, right? So I was just curious about how, and again, this, this can be for future, not right now, but I know that in the past, we in the HIE plan, there was a discussion around different uh, potential data sources to be combined in addition to claims and clinical, social determinants obviously being another. Um, so when you're thinking about the funding issues moving forward, um, having us have a good understanding of how that is changed or not changed, like does that count as maintenance and operations or, does, or not, would be very helpful as well. Um, and then the last um, question I had is, uh, we had asked a question about being able to get a better understanding of um, the reporting that DIVA is now being able to do with the combined claims and clinical. And I know that you had indicated in your answer to the question that um, that material is currently confidential and there's no way to de-identify. So I think my question really is more for our legal team, whether there's some way we can ensure for confidentiality, but I think it'd be just super helpful to have a concrete, for us at least, understanding of what that might look like. Um, yeah. So Our team is working on a way of presenting it to you, so maybe you don't have the data, but you have the structure to at least understand right. what might be in the file, Perfect. which might be how, uh, at least a first step for you as well. Yeah. So Great. We're, we'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Jess. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, so I guess at this point, I'd love to open it up to public comment. If there's anybody from the public that wishes to make a comment. Walter. Jessica. How are Hello, you? Walter. Hello, Jess. It wouldn't be a board meeting without public comment from Walter. So please, the Man. stage is yours. <laughs> Put that into the record, Jess. <laughs> Uh, thanks to Tom and Tom pretty much said what I had on my mind, so I won't bore you with that. But I just have one quick question. Um, the use of consultants. Consultants are usually more expensive than regular employees are. So I'm nervous about that. And as someone who's paying the bills, i.e., you know, as a person who's paying the taxes and the fees and all that that's going into VITAL. I'm <clears throat> concerned about that because they are, consultants can come in very expensive and they're not always right on. So that makes me nervous. So, and, you know, when you use consultants more instead of employees, that's also chintzing people out of benefits too. Yeah. So that's. Yeah, that's a very valid concern. I appreciate you bringing it up. We we have tried to be really um, thoughtful where we use consultants and we use them where we know we have a very specific skill need for a short period of time where we wouldn't want to hire someone and have layoffs or set bad expectations. So it's really to help us complete projects where we just need more hands for another six months or nine months, but it's not a long-term or, and or where we need someone who has a skill set that we either don't need long-term or can't afford long-term, but really need them to help us make our work successful in the near term. We really do try to be very careful. And another thing, um, just as we do contract with consultants, um, they are very often more resources and not kind of these strategic big project consultants. And we do go through a competitive um, RFP process to identify them to, to make sure that we are getting value for what we're, what we're engaging them for. How do you measure the value? Uh, we look at a, that's a great question. I think we look at a couple of things. It's not always just cost or the cheapest consultant, right? That's not necessarily the best way to do it. So we really do a pretty rigorous vetting of their skills, um, references from other types of work they do, both understanding what types of work they've done and getting references on the work that they've done and really holding them accountable for um, 
clear and measurable deliverables along the way on the project to make sure we're meeting our needs and goals. Great. How are you holding them accountable? <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, Jess. Find the next. Well, question. no, that's okay, Walter. Walter, but um, yeah, Beth, if you have an answer to that question, that would be great. If there's a way that you can address the accountability of the consultants. Yeah, I, you know, our contracts do have out clauses. So if things are not going well, we can end an engagement or ask for a different person to be put on a project if the person that's assigned does not have the right skills that we need. Great. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate that. Walter, do you have an addition, any additional questions? I yield the floor, Jess, to someone else. <laughs> okay. I'll shut up. No, I'll we shut up, Jess. <laughs> no, we appreciate your questions, Walter. Uh, they're always good and and, and informed. Um, anybody you else? Haven't have... thrown me off the board yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, anybody else have any public comment or questions at this time? All right. I am not seeing anybody raising their hands. So at this point, I want to uh, thank you all for coming and sharing uh, your budget update with us. Again, I think as Jess Mendizable mentioned, we have a public comment period that's open until June 17th. I think that's right. Um, at that point, you know, we're going to be hearing from our staff on a recommendation and we will have a vote on this budget coming up, hopefully June 22nd. If not, it'll be June 29th. So that's the plan. Forward. So thank you very, very much. We appreciate Beth and team for coming today and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so actually next up is uh, the first of a two-part sequence on ACO guidance. And so Marissa and team, I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you all. Good afternoon. Thank you, board member Holmes, members of the board. My name is Marissa Melamed. I'm associate director of health systems policy with the board. And I'm going to introduce um, this afternoon's presentation. I have uh, several colleagues here with me today that are going to help present um, this uh, first part of the of the FY23 ACO guidance. Um, so I'll be joined by uh, Julia Bull, Senior Health Policy Analyst, and Michelle Sawyer, Health Policy Project Director, for uh, several sections of the presentation. And then our staff attorney, um, Russ McCracken, is available to help us with legal questions. Uh, let me go ahead and the presentation going for you. All right, is that visible? Looking good? Okay, great. So the agenda for today's presentation is a three-part an overview of the ACO guidance process for fiscal year 2023. Uh, we're going to give you a preview of the certified ACO guidance, and then we're going to review the draft for the Medicare only. So I'm going to explain the difference between those two processes, but um, the board has uh, two different types of ACOs that we're looking at that fall under different statutory criteria. Um, they've been done at different times in previous years, and this year we're aligning the process to happen all at once. So we want to make sure it's clear um, what type of guidance that you're looking at. So that's outlined here on this slide. Um, the board both reviews budgets and certification for ACOs. Uh, all ACOs operating in Vermont are subject to budget review. The statute uh, outlines a threshold of 10,000 lives that defines the scope of the review. So it's a little bit more um, in depth for larger ACOs and there's a little bit more discretion on the criteria for smaller ACOs. So the piece of guidance that we are looking at um, uh, is um, referred to in the rule as the annual budget review manual. We, we tend to call it the ACO budget guidance. Um, and there, there's two types of budget, budget guidance, which we will go over with you. For certification, um, only ACOs that want to accept payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance must be certified. Um, and if ACOs plan to be in a Medicare-only program, they are not required to be certified. Um, so for certification, we have something that's known as annual eligibility verification, or for short, the certification form. Um, and the authority that lays this out is 18 BSA 9382 and the Green Mountain Care Board Rule 5. So everything 
points back to there, and we try to be specific um, where we can um, on on what areas um, have authority on what items we're talking about. So we created this visual for you this year to help clarify uh, how we um, figured out what type of guidance we needed to develop. So on the left-hand side, there are uh, ACOs that fall into the category of accepting payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance. This can also include Medicare. Um, there's one ACO operating in Vermont that fits this category. That's One Care Vermont. So certification is required, uh, and we annually develop a certification form. Um, budget review is also required. Uh, so we would look at the size of the ACO. In this case, the ACO is over 10,000 lives. Um, and so the board is required to consider all standards and processes established by Rule 5.0. So we are developing the um, guidance um, consistent um, with those requirements. And we refer to us as the certified ACO guidance. On the right-hand side, there are ACOs that plan to accept payments from Medicare, from a Medicare program only. Um, currently, there's only one ACO operating in Vermont in this category. That's uh, Clover Health Partners um, that we reviewed the budget for for the first time um, for 22. So certification is not required. Um, again, there's that threshold of 10,000 lives. That ACO currently uh, is under that threshold. Um, so the Green Mountain Care Board um, can, can, you know, consider the standards and processes that are most appropriate um, just to properly size that review. So for this type of ACO, we've developed the Medicare only guidance um, that's reviewed and approved annually by the board. So today we're going to focus on the draft of the Medicare only guidance, but I'm going to give you a preview of next week, which is a little bit more detailed uh, certified ACO guidance. And then as a reminder, the standards and requirements by which we review the ACO submissions um, are, are set forth in the uh, statute and the rule, as well as um, the terms of the all-payer ACO model agreement for which we're now in an extension year uh, under that agreement. Um, and specifically under rule uh, section 5.405, um, the board um, may establish or may establish benchmarks, um, sorry, under 5.402, um, and then review the, uh, the budget um, uh, with, you know, with those benchmarks, um, considering those benchmarks. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, all the criteria that's listed, um, that number two is sort of the area that you can have more discretion at for the smaller or Medicare-only ACO. Um, and then again, um, elements of the all-payer ACO model agreement and the sort of catch-all of any other issues at the discretion of the board. This slide may be somewhat familiar, but it outlines the overall approach to ACO oversight for the coming budget year. So we have gone through a process or we're in the process of um, stakeholder review and feedback um, in internal collaboration. Um, it, we also include um, public and board member input from, from these meetings or public comment. Um, we're driven by these four priorities, which we developed last year um, and which we're continuing to this year. I think they're, you know, kind of long-term priorities that are still relevant. Uh, and that is that the um, guidance and the review is um, sort of looked at in this framework of, um, you know, overall, we want to understand ACO financial and quality performance um, over time. We want decisions um, and analysis to be data driven. Um, we're always looking for regulatory alignment and understanding how um, these entities um, and, and the regulation of these entities interacts. Uh, and we're working toward having more standard reporting um, and templates, including metrics and definitions. So that's the reason for sort of generalizing the guidance. Um, instead of saying, like, this is one care guidance or this is Clover guidance, we're, we're trying to make it clear that um, this is general guidance that applies to any ACO that fits this, these categories. Um, and we want to review them in a standard way. It just so happens there's only one in each um, category. And then the outcome of this work um, so far, um, we have for the past, this is now the second year that we've issued a, an, an ACO reporting manual as allowed in the rule, and that um, outlines sort of 
standard reports that we've identified over the over time that we want um, year over year to help us monitor uh, the the performance of the ACO. Um, we did uh, finalize and issue the report for FY22, um, and it was posted on our website on um, May 27th. So if you're interested in the types of reports that come in throughout the year um, from the ACO, these are these are, um, you know, the expectations and templates for those reports are, are in the reporting manual. Um, and then the other outcome is the finalization of the guidance um, for the coming budget year, um, which needs to be approved by uh, July, sorry, June, by the beginning of July, by the end of June. Uh, so that's why we're starting that, that process now. Um, and the timeline, the, the 2022 timeline for development of the 23 guidance. So again, um, May has been a development um, month even, even prior to that really, um, but we've worked more closely with the stakeholders through the month of May, um, including the ACOs, you know, reaching out to the ACOs or meeting with them about guidance requirements, um, as well as the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, today, we will be presenting the Medicare-only ACO guidance draft. Next week, we will present the certification form and the certified ACO budget guidance draft with the potential to vote on June 22nd. So we can issue that by the end of the month um, as you're ready to do so. And as Susan mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, there's a special public comment period on these documents and development, which will run from today through June 20th, so we can get excuse me, public feedback prior to that vote. Um, so I'm going to move from process into giving you this preview of what the certified ACO guidance is going to look like for this year and some of improvements that we've made. So this slide uh, illustrates some goals that we've been working with over the past couple of years to improve the guidance. So. On the left-hand side, these are continued goals from FY22 um, that were developed through debrief processes. We feel as though these are mostly still relevant, um, and we've also made um, Im improvements, and will continue to do so. So, um, we've considered to we've continued to uh, consider these goals as we've been in the budget guidance development phase this year. So that's um, streamlining information requests across regulated entities, so working closely with the hospital budget team, um, as well as uh, rate review because these, these three ent entities um, interact uh, closely uh, to uh, make sure it's clear how we are uh, breaking out and presenting information across processes um, and aligning them to rule five, um, trying to uh, emphasize the data over the narrative and improve many of our data collection templates. Um, we've done a better job separating out uh, information requests. So what we want, you know, we want the budget to be really focused on the budget. What are the factors and assumptions that are going into creating a budget for 23 versus just ongoing monitoring of how things are going. So that's why we've um, been developing that uh, reporting manual prior to the guidance um, for the second year in a row. Um, we're still um, monitoring, considering the impact of, of COVID-19. Um, and the, uh, you know, last year we talked about 2022 being the final year of the current APM agreement. However, that's since been um, extend, extended. So we're now, you know, still working under that agreement in an extension year as we look toward 23. Um, and last year at this time, you heard a presentation from uh, consultant Michael Baylett on core competencies of high performing ACOs. So we have been using that as a framework um, to under, you know, to, to sort of focus what we want to look at with the ACO and also as kind of a benchmark against, um, you know, their own identified um, core competencies or core capabilities through their strategic planning and process. It gives us, um, you know, something to, uh, to, to, to benchmark against as we consider, um, you, you know, the story that they that they tell us about um, their their priorities and how they're setting their budget and, and such. Um, new this year for FY23 um, in our discussions internally and, and with stakeholders, 
we're looking at um, having a clear crosswalk to rule five. So, um, you know, clearly linking why we're asking certain things to requirements. Um, we've spent a, a good deal of time um, removing areas of identified uh, duplication and streamlining questions. And I wouldn't say that this duplication is happening um, because of, of sloppiness. A lot of it is because there's a lot of overlap. Um, you know, the, the ACO, um, uh, you know, several different contracts that come together to then formulate their program. So we may have been asking similar questions um, from different perspectives. And I think we've been able to identify where there's overlap in those, in those questions and how to make it clearer um, and perhaps reduce some duplicative uh, work or narrative. Um, we've also been looking really closely at how to incorporate performance benchmarks and more prescri prescriptive guidance as allowed in Rule 5, Section uh, 402. Um, so this, this has shown up in two ways. One, um, you'll, you know, of course, from the 22 budget order um, that one care is working towards um, implementing an ACO performance um, benchmarking report report um, that, sh you know, should be reported to the board later this summer. Um, so it's not in time to sort of incorporate that reporting into the guidance in any way, but you'll see that we, we're going to present a section um, where we sort of provisionally look at what we might do with that information in a future year so that we can get set up for that. Um, the other piece of this is the ability for the board to say, um, proactively, like on the front end in the guidance, we would like to see a budget that that meets these sort of conditions. Um, up until now, um, conditions have always sort of ended up at the end, like, oh, we review the budget and then we say, oh, great, we want you to do this. But there are some things um, that the board may say, look, we want to we want your board of managers to um, create a budget that meets these requirements or if you can't um, explain why. Um, because these are priorities that we've identified over the years. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, next week, but that's something that we have been looking at and may have some proposals on. So I'm just going to give you a preview again of what the certified ACO guidance looks like um, with some of these changes that I've talked about. So these are the sections. Um, we have added two sections, but I think we've streamline the questions in each. So I don't think that this adds questions necessarily, but makes them more clear. Um, so section one, the executive summary, we just changed the name to clearly call it an executive summary, as in we want a high level overview of what is in the rest of the, um, of what is in the rest of the submission. Sections two and three, we um, streamlined the content of what's in those, um, or we've narrowed it down to, to the basics of, um, of the provider uh, contracts, as in who is contracting with um, with OneCare or the entity, and are there any changes to those base contracts? Um, same thing with the payer contracts section, um, though, you know, we understand that, that some of the, particularly the payer contracting information has to wait to the spring. Um, so instead of having this be broader, like what are your provider programs and what are your payer programs, we're just calling this section contracting and we've added a new section five which is called network program and risk arrangement policies and this is where um, we are instead putting this all into one category and saying like look you have contracts with providers you have contracts with payers please talk to us about the programs that you now develop um, through policy at the ACO level um, you know that these contracts enable um, uh, one care to implement and that was able to reduce some duplication of, of questions. Um, the budget sections, um, there's not necessarily a change there to the uh, to the format. Same thing with quality, population, health, model care, and community integration, though we've done some editing of the questions, which we'll talk about next week. We've created a new section called Evaluation and Performance Benchmark. So we've taken all the evaluation questions and put it into their own section because that seems to have been important enough to call it out instead of having evaluation questions be peppered throughout. Um, and then the section on the performance, you know, what we're going to do with the performance benchmarking information will be in here as well. So just uh, by way of example, um, what we've done for each section, 
um, is make provide a clear objective. What is the you know what is the point of the section? Um, clearly lay out what data we're collecting or what source documents, like primary source documents, we're collecting, and then what narrative we need in order to explain that data or those source documents. So we've created an outline kind of like this for each section. Um, and that will be in the more detailed review. Um, we've also, so we want to make it clear, um, you know, what what we are uh, what we are asking for in each section, and why we are asking for it. So for this section one, um, you know, the executive summary should have a brief, um, you know, summary of each of these aspects, which you'll then read about in more depth. Um, as you go through the submission. So an update on the strategic plan, um, changes to the provider network, payer programs, what are the attribution estimates, um, the two budget uh, looks that we've been working with for the past several years and, and recently talked about in our revised budget presentation, um, and then the overall changes to network programs and population health and, and the care model for 23. Um, and evaluation, uh, how, how they're looking at evaluation for 23, uh, lessons learned, plans for the future, um, and a summary of the ACO performance benchmarking results to date. So that brings me to the end of the preview of the certified ACO guidance. I'm going to pass it over to Julia, who's going to review with you the Medicare-only uh, draft guidance. Perfect. Thank you so much. And nods so that people can hear me. Perfect. Thank you. Just always want to check the technology. Um, wonderful. We can go to the next slide, Marissa. So I know Marissa just covered this chart, but just wanted to reorient since we are covering two different types of guidance today. Um, everything I will be covering is specific to the Medicare only guidance. And again, just to really briefly walk through how we got here. Um, this is guidance for ACOs that only accept payments from Medicare, um, which is why we're, I will keep saying Medicare only again and again throughout this presentation. Um, and in this case, the guidance we've developed is for Medicare only ACOs that have less than 10,000 attributed lives within the state of Vermont. And because of that size, the standards of review are those that the board deems appropriate. Um, whereas if the ACO had been larger than 10,000 lives, or if at any point that happens, we would um, broaden the guidance to be all of the standards within Rule 5. Um, and again, this guidance is not for any particular ACO, but applies to any ACO that fits the criteria, um, which in this case follows the, the right-hand side of this chart. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and just wanted to give a bit of background today. Um, there we go. Thank you. Probably just a delay on the slides. Um, so wanted to just sort of reorient um, the a bit of history on this guidance. So as you will remember, because it was not too long ago, um, we just reviewed the budget um, for Clover Health Partners FY22 budget. Um, and this was the first time that we were reviewing a Medicare-only ACO. And in this process now with the guidance, it is the second time that this guidance is coming before the board. Um, and again, as you know, any Medicare-only ACO will have a participation agreement with CMS. Um, so there are a lot of elements of the program that, uh, you know, and the ACO's operations that are specified in the CMS requirements. And that is something that we've been trying to keep in mind throughout this guidance process as we have learned more about how Medicare-only ACOs operate. Um, and again, for further background, um, last year when we were reviewing Clover's budget, they were participating in the direct contracting model. Um, and this model is being sunset by CMS and replaced with the ACO reach model starting at FY23. Um, so while this is the second year of ACO or um, Medicare only guidance um, that the board is looking at, this will be sort of a new year in terms of the program that we anticipate the ACO participating in. Um, and the REACH model has a number of new requirements specifically related to ACO governance, as well as a larger focus on health equity. Um, and we linked in the slide here to a CMS graphic that has a really nice just breakdown of a lot of the key elements of the new REACH model. Um, so on the next slide, um, 
for further background, I wanted to just take a minute to cover the sort of the beneficiary experience as it relates to the ACO REACH model. Um, and most importantly, keeping in mind that the model is an agreement between um, CMS, the REACH ACO, and the providers who are con contracting um, with the REACH ACO. Um, so it doesn't change or limit a beneficiary's access to services or providers. Um, and the ACO does not have any control about where a patient seeks care or whether a patient sees a provider that is part of the ACO's network. Um, so to be even more specific, um, again, beneficiaries are still in traditional Medicare. They have access to the entire traditional Medicare network. Their alignment to a reach ACO does not affect their out-of-pocket costs or the premiums that they pay for traditional Medicare and it does not affect their use of supplemental insurance. It's really a sort of behind the scenes um, payment model as it relates to providers and not um, an upfront impact on beneficiaries um, with the exception of the fact that if a beneficiary is aligned to um, a REACH provider, they might have access to additional benefits that are called enhanced benefits in the context of the model. So on the next slide, um, Similar to what Marissa covered with the certified ACO guidance, we wanted to cover sort of our thinking and our goals to updating the Medicare only guidance this year. Um, so as we look to FY23, we had a few goals in mind that dictated our approach. Um, and in terms of goals, the focus of the budget review was twofold. Um, first, transparency to shed light on the operations of Medicare only ACOs with fewer than 10,000 lives in Vermont. Um, and secondly, a focus on the GMCB's area of jurisdiction. Um, again, with that framing that CMS does dictate many ele elements of these programs um, and keeping in mind the size of the ACO under this guidance. Um, so with those goals as our framework, our approach to updating the guidance, um, particularly given that this is the second year of the guidance and the first year of the REACH program, um, was first and, and similar to um, the, the certified ACO um, to really be focused in our questions, um, specifically for the Medicare-only ACO to narrow the focus to budget-specific requirements, um, including the removal of questions that are more appropriate for the certification process, and um, importantly, that the board and staff did not rely on during last year's budget review. Um, and secondly, to update the questions and the appendices to reflect our improved understanding of Medicare-only arrangements, including what CMS requires versus what the ACO has flexibility to design in their program. Um, and I also wanted to thank the HCA for working with us and providing input on this draft. Um, so with that, um, on the next slide, we have links to where um, folks can find the documents that I will be referring to today. Everything lives on the, the board meeting page of the website, um, but the slides, um, if you get there, have links to the different copies. We have a red line copy as well as a clean copy. Um, they're just different views of the same thing if, if you don't want to look at too much red. Um, and then the appendices, which is an Excel document where red is used to denote um, things that were changed from last year. Um, and again, as Susan said, we have an active public comment period um, through June 20th. And then just a quick key, um, anything in bolded blue represents changes um, as we go through the next few slides. Um, so we have one slide per section. Um, so I will just be going through them in order and then have um, Michelle help with the last few. But um, the first section is called ACO Information, Background and Governance. Um, the main change to this section was removing submissions that fall under certification and that the board and staff did not rely on in last year's budget review. Specifically, these were in question four, removing the submission of bylaws, operating agreement, or equivalent document, and question five, the conflict of interest policy. Um, and with all of that said, again, there are still questions in the guidance that get at specific information about ACO governance. And um, the REACH model also has new governance requirements. Um, and then additionally in question five, um, we added a clarification to, to clarify that the question was referring to executive leadership compensation, um, which was just sort of a, a cleanup clarification because we had asked a follow-up question last year. Um, so just sort of codifying it in this year's guidance. Um, 
Section two, um, the main change is the addition of Appendix A2. Um, and when you look at the red line copy, you will see a lot of track changes in this section, um, but it's really just clean up, um, specifically questions one and two. Um, there's a lot of text that we had both in the narrative and the appendix and realized that it would be simpler to just keep that information in the appendix. Um, so when you see stuff being cut in the narrative, it's only because that same information is covered elsewhere. Um, and because this is year two of the Medicare only guidance, we added Appendix A2, um, which asks the ACO to summarize provider network changes and reasons for provider departures, if there are any. Um, and then based on some of the follow-up questions we asked last year, we also clarified question four to more clearly get at whether the ACO has plans to expand their network in Vermont and their related recruitment and network development strategies. Um, so just making that question a little more robust based on some follow-up that we did last year. Section three is about the ACO payer programs. Um, there were no major content changes, but very similarly to section two, there's a lot of red markup. Um, again, because the text was in both the narrative and the appendix, and we wanted to keep it in the appendix but remove it from the narrative. Um, and we also changed the layout of Appendix B to make it more reader friendly, um, just from horizontal to a vertical layout. So it'll look different, but all of the questions are still the same. Um, and additionally, in question five, um, again, just to sort of clarify the language, we, we changed it to say for all measures in a question about quality, as opposed to having a long list of all of the measures um, and so just adding all to capture it but again um, the cuts that you see in red are not um, substantial changes the next section section four is the aco budget and financial planning section um, there were no major content changes in this section um, just some small updates um, specifically in question two we added a funds flow chart um, to summarize the different types of funds. And this was actually just a chart that Clover created in their submission to answer our questions last year. And we felt like it was just a nice way to summarize the information. So we wanted to um, sort of default have it as, as the best way to answer the question. Um, and additionally, we cut part of question two because the same information was better covered um, later in that same section under question five. Um, and otherwise, all the other changes in section four were just small text changes to reflect um, the FY23. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Michelle to cover the next few slides. Perfect. Thank you, Julia. So section five covers model care and community integration. Um, there are a total of seven main questions in this section, um, and like the other sections of the guidance, we work to improve questions in an effort to prompt concise, clear, and comprehensive answers. Um, the primary updates were around the questions included on the slide. So questions one and two were updated to align with the budget section of rule five. Um, previously, there had been parts of these questions that had incorporated requirements of ACO certification, uh, but given that the Medicare only ACO is not required to be certified, these certification requirements were removed. In addition, we ensured that all aspects of the budgetary review requirements were included in these questions for fiscal year 23. Question three was an addition to this year's guidance to better capture any um, health equity efforts being made by the ACO. Um, given that this is a requirement of the REACH model, we anticipate that we'll receive an insightful answer. Uh, questions uh, five and six were updated. Uh, this year in response to our experience with last year's questions, the staff found that the previous versions of these questions had resulted in responses that required additional follow-up questions. So we're hopeful that these updates uh, will prompt complete and clear answers regarding the matters at hand. And finally, um, question seven was added to the guidance this year. Um, it was a question that had arisen in follow-up um, last year. Um, so the ACO was asked uh, if they benchmark performance measures against similar entities, and if so, how the information is used. Uh, next slide, please. So the final um, section of the guidance 
is Section 6, which covers the Vermont All-Payer ACO Model Agreement Scale Target ACO Initiative. Um, so no changes were made to this section. Uh, it includes three different tables regarding scale, financials, and quality measures. Um, next slide, please. And then this has been reviewed earlier uh, in the presentation, so I won't go through it, but um, take home message is that any potential vote on this guidance is sl uh, slated for June 22nd, so no action is required today of the board. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, this concludes our presentation and I'll hand it back to you, board member Holmes. Great, thank you so very much. Um, and I just, I wanna say, I'm probably on behalf of the whole board, but certainly my own opinion is that I really appreciate all the hard work that you all did, um, streamlining the process, trying to reduce the, you know, the guidance, trying to reduce the duplication and actually ensuring that we have all the data and information that we need to make decisions. So very much appreciated. Um, I'll just kick it off actually with just one question or actually really a comment. Um, in terms of the the uh, health equity question, I think health and healthcare disparities often focus on race and ethnicity, um, and the question actually highlights race and race and ethnicity there. And I just wonder if we should expand that health equity question to include socioeconomic status, disability status, sexual identity orientation, and really with respect to Vermont, um, although it's just, this is uh, you know the rurality or the geography location of where people are and their access to care um, and their health outcomes as related to where they live. So just a thought to broaden that health equity question a bit, um, but I really appreciate uh, everything that you all did here. So I, I would love to open it up to other board questions. And does anybody have any? Or is this just so thorough and clear that nobody has questions? I do not have any questions. I thought it was very thorough and clear and uh, I liked the red line copy so I could see clearly what changed. Great. I like the red line copy because there was a lot of red line. <laughs> Great, okay. Well, it sounds like uh, we don't have any questions from the board. I'd love to open it up to public comment if there is any at this time. Sam, go ahead from the HCA. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you. I just wanted to briefly thank the ACO team for the opportunity to work together on this. I think that you landed in a really great place in showing that we can balance reducing administrative burden, I think, and overlap with a lot of valuable questions that get at data criteria and evaluation that are really important. And I agree with your point, Member Holmes, about uh, expanding the definition on health equity. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, just wanted to thank the group. Uh, it was a great collaboration. I look forward to doing so more in the future. Great, thank you, Sam. Any other public comments or questions? Okay, I am not seeing any. Um, so with that, I guess, thank you, Marissa and team. We look forward to, obviously, we're gonna have part two next week. Um, and as always, we welcome public comment on this and any issues, particularly this special comment period will be open until I think June 20th, if I have my date right. Is that right, Marissa? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, I think with that, um, we are set with our kind of substantive parts of the meeting. So is there any old business to come before the board today? No. Is there any new business to come before the board today? <laughs> no. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. <laughs> all right. We are set for the day, and I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you all.